just before um, we move on to uh, the agenda, um, I'm going to switch the chairing of this meeting uh, and appoint the cabinet member uh, to chair. So if we, if I nominate Councillor Lonovar to appoint to chair the meeting, would that be seconded? Second that, Chair. Thank you. And then I'll happily take the nomination for vice chair uh, for this meeting, if you'd like to nominate me. Oh, Sorry, the vice that, chair. It's a director, isn't it? No, it, Who is it's, it? a, it's, an, uh, it's an NHS representative. It's an NHS representative. And, it, and ideally, fine. I think it should be a clinical leader. So who? Um, and we would, I think there's a paper on, on the governance, isn't there, Steve, on, on the agenda for the meeting. Okay, there we so, go. Then I've missed that. Apologies. Hmm? So when we get to it, Should, yep, Steve, I, go ahead. So, so there, there is a paper that talks about the membership. Um, it's the sort of first um, substantive item on, on the agenda. It doesn't specifically mention who the vice chair would be, be, though. So I guess that's Sarah's proposal is that it would be one of the clinical reps from the NHS. But we, we don't have them in the room um, for this meeting. Okay. So, so who are you proposing that we nominate? So I'd be pro proposing uh, Nupa Yogaraja, who okay. is our, one of our clinical care professional leads who under, oversees all of the Be Well and the Health Inequalities uh, agenda. Um, I'm expecting her to, to come today, um, but she's not here at this point in time. Okay, fair enough. Um, is that accepted by the board? Fantastic. Marion, would you like to step up? Yeah, I've been nominated to this chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Okereke. Yes. <laughs> um, so I will be chairing now. Um, so I think we've done uh, item one, appointment of chair and vice chair. So, um, and also just to introduce myself, for those who don't know, my name's Councillor Marin Lolivar. I'm the new cabinet lead for uh, health, adult social care and borough of sanctuary. So I'm um, very happy to be chairing um, and very nice to meet you all. Um, so on item two, I've got apologies for absence. Do we have any apologies? Yes, Chair. Um, sorry, Chair. Chair Ben Travis, Claire Pritchard, uh, uh, Rev Pathania, and Florence Kroll. And any more? No? Don't see any. Okay. Uh, item three, uh, any urgent business? I don't have any, and I don't see any in the room. No? No, well, Sarah. I, I just wonder if it's worth going around the room doing some introductions because we do have some new members uh, of the Health and Wellbeing Board. And also, can I just say, colleagues, we don't normally meet in the council chamber. <laughs> it's not quite as, as formal as this usually. Um, but it might be worth just introducing ourselves. Okay, so um, if you haven't used the mics before, there's a little button uh, in front of you. You kind of will have to press on and off. Um, we can only use one mic at a time, so you have to remember to turn it off before you finish. So should we start with Steve and work our way around? Morning, everyone. I'm Steve Whiteman, the Director of Public Health for the Council. Joy B. Sean, Chief Executive of Healthwatch Greenwich. Uh, I'm Andrew George. Uh, I'm the new chair of uh, Oxley's. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ian Diamond. I'm Chief Operating Officer at Oxley's, and I'm the current chair of the Healthier Greenwich Partnership. 
Um, Mark Delacour, pronouns he, him, uh, Metro Gavs. Anthony O'Kirica, Lido British Council. Adele Cairo, Cabinet Member for Children and Young People. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anne-Marie Cousins. I'm the Cabinet Member for, oh, here we go, Equalities, newly appointed Equalities Culture and Communities, or Fun, Frolics and Festivities, as I <laughs> like to refer to it, as, as we know, those things are crucial for our health. Thank you. I'm Rachel Taggart Ryan. I am the uh, Cabinet Member for Community Safety and Enforcement. Hi, everyone. Um, Neil Kenner Brown. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Greenwich, uh, working for the ICB under Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah McClinton. I'm the Director of Health and Adult Services and the Place Executive Lead in Greenwich. Morning, everyone. Dave Borland, Integrated Commissioning Director for Children and Young People, and I'm here for Florence Kroll. Thank you very much. Um, and so, moving on, I think, to point uh, agenda four, I've got declarations of interest. Do we have any? Oh, yes, Rachel. It's actually just a point of clarification. So, on the declaration of interest table, we are all deputies of Elton Krem Joint Committee, um, which is news to me. Does that come with? Yeah, it is all on there. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving on to item five, we've got uh, minutes from the previous uh, meeting which have been circulated. Um, and I guess, did, are there any points of clarification on the minutes? Or not? No? And then I've, what's this? And then for me to sign. And is everyone happy for me to sign? Accurate representation? I wasn't at the meeting, so I won't be able to. <laughs> Thank you. Brilliant. That is done. Okay. So, uh, agenda item six, we have uh, Greenwich Health and Wellbeing Board Context Membership Changes and Development Proposal. And Steve, is this in regards to the paper that you mentioned before? So I'll hand over to you, Steve. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, yes, as, as this is the first Health and Wellbeing Board of the new municipal year and we, we are uh, seeing some new members, we thought it would be helpful to combine um, a paper that looks at a number of related issues. So um, it kind of has three parts to it, really, this, um, this paper. The first one is uh, to, to remind people um, about the current context for the Health and Wellbeing Board in Greenwich, which, which includes some of the history to the establishment of Health and Wellbeing Boards, their purposes um, and the way that ours runs which um, for people who don't know we have four meetings a year two of them are formal meetings um, here in the town hall as Sarah says they're not usually quite as formal as, as this one in the council chambers but they're where we take um, sort of papers that require uh, uh, decisions or where the Health and Wellbeing Board has a formal responsibility, so things like pharmaceutical needs assessment and the Better Care Fund uh, are specific responsibilities, as is the uh, Health and Wellbeing Strategy. Uh, then we have the other two meetings um, per year, uh, which we tend to uh, operate out of, the bit, out of this um, town hall and in community venues, so that might be uh, we've been to uh, a, a sort of multi-use health and voluntary sector centre in Kibbrook. Uh, the last meeting, which we'll, you'll hear about um, uh, later on in the agenda, was in uh, Glindon Community Centre. We've been on a visit to the targeted lung health check mobile unit. So a sort of range of different sorts of um, uh, visits and venues so that the board can hear from local people and organizations that are involved on the ground in some of the um, work to improve health and tackle health inequalities, hear about some of the good practice and also some of the challenges that are, uh, are experienced by our, our residents and our colleagues um, out and about. Um, so that's kind of how the, how the board has operated up, up until this point. Uh, I'll, I'll pause there and hand over to Neil, um, if that's okay, Neil. I think you're expecting me to do that. Yeah. We thought it would be useful just to cover a bit about the, the kind of the broader context of South East London at the moment. Yeah, thanks very much, Steve. Um, yeah, so people might be aware that we've got our um, South East London Integrated Care Board 
uh, which is established. Um, these were established in 2022, um, and for South East London covers the six boroughs, um, including uh, Greenwich. And that's about all of us working uh, effectively uh, together, what we often term the phrase of sort of system of systems, recognizing that for organizations like Oxley's that serve uh, at least three of our six boroughs, but also actually have services out and beyond that, if we look at Lewisham and Greenwich Trust, serve uh, a couple of those, what a couple of our boroughs in terms of particularly Lewisham and Greenwich, but also uh, for the, half of the population or so uh, for Bexley. And the only way we're going to actually improve services is by working more effectively together. So the Health and Wellbeing Board um, has its kind of really key role here, but it's about kind of coordinating and bringing things together to ensure people um, live that kind of uh, best, get their best um, outcomes uh, together. Um, and the other thing that sort of sits within the ICS kind of model is very much a focus on kind of work with the voluntary and community sector. So recognition very much that only 20% of someone's health outcome is actually determined by how good your healthcare services are. 80% is about all the wider factors about employment, opportunities, education, uh, loneliness, and those wider determinants of health. And so actually it's by working together across the system that we're going to do that with our, with our communities uh, to do that. So the South East London Integrated Care System has set a strategy. We've got five priorities that are set out in section 5.6 of the paper, which are around uh, prevention and wellbeing, early years, uh, children and young people's mental health, adult mental health, and primary care, and people with long-term uh, conditions. So that's our, our focus and we actually deliver those uh, priorities um, and we've created a, uh, a single health and care strategy for Greenwich which captures those priorities as well as fully aligned to the missions from our Greenwich which is obviously the democratic accountability piece uh, for here in Greenwich. So bringing all of that together and it's our local care partnership helps deliver uh, that work and in as he introduced himself is the care chair of our healthy Greenwich partnership which sits underneath the health wellbeing board which is actually for driving through our improvement work um, as a borough um, so that's I think what I was going to highlight as the key changes I don't know if there's anything else uh, Steve you want me to add no I think that's 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 fine thanks Neil um, so, so that's the sort of contextual bit. Uh, the, the second section of the paper is around some changes to board membership, which was um, re referenced earlier. Uh, so, uh, so this describes the current, um, the, you've got a, appendices, which are one of which is the current membership and one of which is the proposed membership. But the, the key differences that are being suggested um, are, uh, you, you'll see in the paper, we've got the, um, the, the leader and the cabinet members listed there, um, colleagues who are, who are here today. Um, that's, that's been through full council, um, and so that stands. Uh, then, um, in terms of the NHS membership, uh, due to some, some leadership changes, uh, what, what is being proposed by um, our ICB colleagues is that we have two representatives from the ICB, and that would be uh, the uh, clinical uh, lead that was referenced earlier, who we're suggesting um, uh, could be the vice chair of this group, plus um, your role, Neil, isn't it? Um, uh, uh, and then um, a representative from Lewisham and Greenwich Trust, a representative from Oxley's, uh, and a primary care network clinical director. And we have written to the, the PCN directors um, to say pending the um, agreement here, uh, would they identify somebody to, um, to be their representative on this, on this body? Um, and then the only other changes are around um, the role of the voluntary and community sector uh, in terms of membership of this board. Uh, we already have the representative of Healthwatch, who's sitting on my left, um, from Greenwich Action for Voluntary Services, from Metro Gavs, and Mark is here um, with that hat on today. Uh, and we are also proposing that there be two further representatives from the community and voluntary sector um, uh, attending this, uh, this board, uh, given the, um, the, the breadth and contribution that that sector makes to the health and well-being of the population. Um, so those are the proposed um, changes to membership. 
Then the final section of the paper is around um, putting to the board an offer that we've had made to us from the local government association, the LGA. Um, they have a funded program that they, um, that they offer to uh, local health and wellbeing boards um, to support them in kind of reviewing their operation and their effectiveness and their impact. Uh, so they have asked us if we would like to avail ourselves of their services for free um, and uh, spend some time with them reflecting uh, for those people who've been involved in the board up till now on how well it's, it's worked um, and then thinking about well, any changes that we might want to make or learning from other areas um, and how they operate their health and well-being boards that we might want to consider going forward. So the suggestion is that they, um, they use a model where they basically have some interviews with people who've been associated with or sitting on the board um, up until this point. Uh, they kind of synthesize that and bring together their knowledge of how it operates in other places uh, and then facilitate a session with the board, a sort of developmental session where they play that back and we have a discussion about any learning or changes or improvements that we, we want to make. So the, the, if, if the board is in agreement that um, it would be a good opportunity to take up this offer, uh, the suggestion is that, that we let them know and then the interviews will sort of start uh, one by one over the summer um, period. And then we have our next informal health and wellbeing board on the 10th of September, and we could use that as the sort of workshop session for them to play back uh, what they've heard from us and what they know from other places. So I think that's, in a nutshell, what we are suggesting. They also have a number of other products that they are uh, uh, a, uh, willing to make available to us, some sort of written um, guides around good practice in health and wellbeing boards, a self-assessment tool that they have, which they might use as part of the interviews, I guess, um, and particularly looking at, uh, at where impact um, has been demonstrated um, by health and wellbeing boards, um, which is obviously the purpose of, of us existing, really, to have, uh, to have some impact and, and um, not be a talking shop, but be, be effective. So that's... Um, so I guess first is any comments or questions in regards to those proposals? Um, Joy. Yeah, I think it sounds a very sensible suggestion with regards to involving the LGA. I think um, anything that this board can do to assess its own effectiveness and find opportunities for increased effectiveness, um, I think is, is a very good idea. My only query, which is one that I raised with, with Steve earlier, is would it not make sense to have the LGA do the development work and then change the membership if that's something that the LGA thinks would be um, useful because they might have some ideas coming out of the development work about the increased membership. Um, my question goes back to the composition of the board changes. Um, with these changes, it seems that the chair of the health scrutiny board has dropped off. I uh, wondered what the rationale for that was. I, having done that role, I thought it was hugely valuable to have the scrutiny chair on this board. Um, so that's a query. Um, <clears throat> sorry, just to add um, in this same sort of area of concern, uh, thanks for the report. I'm very glad to hear about the LGA. I, I think we'd be shooting ourselves in the foot to say no to that. It needs to be done because unfortunately my questions were going to be around why are we actually having a health and well-being board? What's its purpose and what is it achieving? So I think that's crucial because why are we doing this? Are we doing this because statutorily we must or are we doing it because there is a need? And then that goes back because I was going to link that to my my, what is it? I'm always going on about the equality statement. And I always find it very peculiar that services like this, where, for example, there's health inequalities, that we're doing things which has no impact, remote or low, to the subject of equalities. And I just don't 
um, understand that at all. I accept that maybe I'm looking at it wrong, but if that's the case, someone needs to convince me. I don't see that it can be, we're changing something. Why are we changing it? We're obviously, hopefully we're changing it for the better. What's that based on? So how could there be a remote or low impact on equal, I, you know? So yes, I think that review will be crucial to save me asking too many complicated questions. Thank you. I can't see any more. Um, I don't know if, Sarah, I can come to you, but maybe wait until Rachel comes back on the scrutiny point, because I think it would be key that she hears it. But I don't know if between you and Steve, you wanted to respond to the rest of the comments first. Do you want to lead? Yeah. Uh, I suppose I could start with um, Councillor Cousins' question. So, yes, it is a statutory requirement to have the board. Um, the, um, as Steve described at the beginning, we've moved to having two formal boards and two informal boards a year because actually the informal boards take place out uh, in our communities uh, and they very much have a focus on uh, health inequalities. We've had themed sessions on particular neighborhoods or mental health, for example. Uh, so that's very much how we've tried to sort of think about health inequalities and the work of the board in a slightly more grounded and, and meaningful way. But the formal board has to meet, I'm told, uh, within uh, the council, and that is a statutory requirement. Um, but it doesn't have to be made up as it is. It doesn't have to have as many members, for example. So that's something that we could review uh, as part of this work. Um, and uh, you know, there, are, there are different ways that we can shape the board, but it is a statutory requirement to have it. Uh, I think I've answered both your parts. But, so the purpose. So, so the purpose of the Health and Wellbeing Board is that uh, to have oversight of um, the health and, uh, and care and wider system in Greenwich. So within the, what's now the Integrated Care Board across six boroughs, there are six health and wellbeing boards. So each place, uh, this is, if you like, where the governance for place uh, uh, sits. Boards were, I could go into a history lesson if you want, but you probably don't, <laughs> but, you know, the, the health and uh, wellbeing I think, boards. Let, I think we've got quite a few questions, so if we can keep moving yeah, on. Okay. Yeah. Maybe that's something okay, that, that I can take up on. We can talk outside of this meeting. Yeah, and we could pick that up in the yeah. review as well. Yeah, that's fine, that would no be problem. Helpful. In terms of um, uh, Councillor Taggart Ryan's question, uh, yes, you're right. The chair of scrutiny uh, shouldn't sit on this board. This is a, um, an executive board, and the role of scrutiny is very much to scrutinize. So, yes, that, um, the chair is very welcome, and in my experience, often attends, but it's not a formal member of the board. Do you want to come back on? No, it's just a, a separate comment, just on the, the the changes and particularly the inclusion of additional voluntary and community sector representation. I know um, Steve and I we hosted a, a meeting with a number of voluntary sector organisations. There's a number of kind of quite large voluntary sector organisations in the borough who'd be really keen to kind of get their voice into setting uh, the health and wellbeing strategy. So fundamentally, just. This board basically owns the health and well-being strategy for the borough, and that's what we have done, and we've got one uh, that, that we have uh, approved, and that sets the whole direction of travel. So that's kind of our role to both set that strategy and then review its uh, implementation. But the voluntary and community sector are really keen to get a bit more representation onto this group, so I'm really pleased with this recommendation. Just wanted to endorse that. So hopefully that answers everyone's questions. Yes, and no more? No. One more from Sarah. So just one more point on membership. I think it is important that we have representation from um, uh, Lewisham and Greenwich Trust. Unfortunately, this meeting clashed with their board meeting, so it wasn't possible um, for them to come today, but we will follow that up separately after the meeting. Um, so I think then ultimately we're kind of asking for the decision here to approve the proposed changes to the board membership that we've just talked through, but then also taking up that LGA support offer. Um, one more comment from Councillor Ocker. I just want to see how we're going to resolve this point about um, when we get the LGA board involvement uh, involved, because it seems like the point that Joy made was quite a powerful one. Thank you. I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear all of that. 
I was just going to make the point about when we do the review um, in terms of the point that uh, Joy made. Thank you. Perfect. Do you want to come back on that, Steve? I think, I think you're referring to the point about do we ask for the uh, two, two new members from the VCS now or do we ask the LGA to include looking at that issue and membership generally as part of the review. So I think that's just a straight choice to make, mm. really. I mean, we, can do, we could do both. We could ask for two reps from the VCS to join um, and uh, be part of that development process, but as part of that, commit to also looking at membership and um, uh, you know, reviewing whether we've got too many or, or we need to operate in a, in a different way. Um, that, that would be my, my yeah. preference, um, but uh, others may. And I think just to kind of come in there, um, and it perhaps connects probably to the point that Anne-Marie, I think, was making before, I, would th I think if anything, including more VCS membership, it would be a positive thing. So my, I would be inclined to include them, but keep that point within the review, and maybe other things come up. But for me, I feel like bringing more people from the outside in would be helpful, but I don't know if anyone else has any comments on that. Counts cousin. Yes, I, I agree with what you said. That's what I'd wanted to say, that we, this, we get started. I am curious to know who, because there's usually issues about that. I mean, if the focus, for example, say is mental health, I think that that's a sort of like a clue. But it, I'd be interested to know who. And also as well, you know, in making decisions now, you're not binded forever. So when is the next review? So we should be review, constantly reviewing. Something doesn't work, we change it because we're supposed to be trying to achieve something, isn't it? Thanks. So on that basis, we'll be people happy to continue with the proposed membership, but then we ask for the review to include just looking at that as well. Yes, and nods, okay. So then I think it is back to that ultimately option two, uh, sorry, option one. So it's approving the proposed changes to the board membership and agreeing the offer of support from the LGA. Is everyone happy with that? Yes, agreed. Great, perfect, okay. Mm, what have we got next? So now, ah, so now we're moving on to the annual report from the Chief Executive of Health Watch Greenwich. So, Joy, over to you. Thank you. Um, and um, I'll be asking Daniel to move the slides down when we get to each page. Um, Thank you very much um, for giving the opportunity to present our annual report um, to the Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, the actual report itself won't be published until um, after the general election, um, but please do feel free to um, ask any questions at the end of the presentation. So just to start off with, um, what do we actually do? So our mission is to gather the views of local people about their health and care needs, but also the experiences they have in accessing and using health and care services. We are different from other voluntary sector organisations because we have a statutory duty to ensure that the voices of the community are heard and acted upon. And we do that by using insights, using the data we collect. We work and support with our system partners, some of whom are here today, uh, to really ensure that services are designed and delivered in ways that meet community needs. We also offer an information and signposting service to tell residents about the available health and care services and to signpost them to resources that are available to them. Um, and I like to think that our work does contribute to positive changes um, in local health and care services based on real community insights. Next slide, please. Um, so quick um, summary of highlights from our year. Um, it's probably useful to preface this by saying that we're a team of seven, but actually we make up less than six full-time equivalents. Um, and we've been busy. Um, so over the past year, nearly 3,500 people, Greenwich residents mainly, have shared their experiences with us. Um, over 24,000 people got advice and information from us on accessing services. And that's obviously using our face-to-face -face outreach, our engagement and through our website and social media channels. Um, we've published over 100 updates, briefings and reports about residents' experiences and their desired improvements. And we visited 11 learning disability care homes in the borough. 
But actually, as a small team, we're only able to do this with the support of our volunteers. And over the course of this year, 67 people, um, most of them Greenwich residents. Others are not Greenwich residents, but they work or use services in Greenwich. Essentially, um, 67 people have given their time to help us. Um, and actually, our volunteer program has been awarded the um, Investing in Volunteering Quality Mark, which we are quite pleased about. Um, and a complete surprise to us, because um, we weren't expecting it, we won an Employability Award um, from Greenwich University, um, um, beating some rather stiff competition from uh, AstraZeneca, I think, and GSK. So... Um, so um, I just want to, oh, you've already moved, sorry. Uh, okay, I was just going to say, I just want to say a bit more about the work we've been doing. So maternity care for asylum seeking and recently migrated women. So we collaborated with the South East London Maternity and Neonatal System to understand the maternity experiences of asylum seeking or recently migrated women. We used a very particular methodology, uh, participatory methods. So we actually recruited, trained, supported, and paid a group of recently migrated and asylum-seeking women to be our co-researchers. Uh, and these women didn't just collect the data, they actually shaped the, the design of this project, they supported the analysis, and they also took part in the presentation of the findings. Um, and as a result of this work, which is part of a whole tranche of work that the South East London Maternity and Neonatal System was carrying out, um, it's actually committed to delivering, the system's committed to delivering cultural competence training for staff um, and doing more to ensure that migrant and asylum-seeking women know, know their rights, essentially. Um, and one of the ways that they're doing that is thinking much more about how they engage and communicate with those women. Next slide, please. Um, we also supported patients earlier on the year to find a new GP practice when the Clover Health Centre closed. Um, this was actually quite interesting because um, most GP practices require um, online registration, um, but a significant, significant proportion of those people we helped either didn't have a smartphone, didn't have access to um, a laptop, or if they did, they didn't always have the skills to navigate those digital systems um, and forms. Uh, and essentially, we were able to sit beside them um, with our laptops and with our smartphones um, and essentially guide them through the, the online registration process. But actually, as part of that, we were able to share with our primary care colleagues some thoughts on potentially how the registration process could be made a bit easier and more accessible um, to those people using that service. Uh, and also a reminder again, um, the ID documentation isn't a requirement for people that um, need to register with a GP, um, despite many, many registration forms explicitly stating that it was essential um, and it actually isn't. Um, next slide, please. Um, we've also been doing um, quite a lot of work with um, our colleagues in public health, um, facilitating a series of workshops, bringing together community leaders to really co-produce a model of mental well-being support. Um, so community leaders told us that access to support varies within and between communities, um, while younger people might be more open to talking about how they feel and the struggles that they might have, they were actually less likely to know where to go to actually get support if they needed it. And also there was a, quite a lot of conversation about stigma, which meant that for some communities it was simply a topic they, they just didn't want to engage with. Next slide, please. Um, what we heard was that overall across really all communities, there was a real low level of awareness of information and resources that could be used to support mental well-being. Um, and even those who tried to find information and resources had, had found it quite difficult. And it was quite interesting because what we heard was that labels such as social prescribing just weren't very helpful. People didn't really know what that meant, what they could access through it. It was a meaningless label for them. Um, 
Also, we heard something that we've all here heard before around how the sort of current approach of disseminating information didn't work because it wasn't always targeted, it wasn't always tailored, um, information only being, able, only being available in English or only being available um, online. Um, there was also an interesting discussion on, on cultural sensitivity and trust um, and a feeling that in many services there was a lack of understanding of cultural and religious beliefs and practices which essentially meant that some communities didn't trust the services didn't believe that those services would meet their needs um, and were therefore reluctant to use them and for very specific groups of people there was a real concern that their information might be sort of shared with other agencies like the benefit agency or the home office which again made them sort of really reluctant to sort of come forward and access services um, quite a lot of, of community leaders suggested that um, for, for them and their members uh, GPs would usually be their first port of call if they were looking for resources um, but um, um, often um, GP practices weren't always that great um, in terms of providing that information or in terms of signposting next slide please um, so I suppose one of the, the sort of big findings was that, and again, I'm sure it's something that many of you here are aware of, is that um, residents just prefer often to seek support from trusted community leaders over statutory services. Um, there's a level of trust and understanding there that they don't always feel that they're going to get from statutory or council services. Next slide, please. So what is it that community leaders were asking for um, more community engagement more outreach to increase awareness of what's out there what services and resources are out there and how to um, access them um, many people spoke about the fantastic work um, that many services did during covid to work with communities but how a lot of that just sort of fell away once the pandemic um, was over um, the idea of, of sort of ambassadors was, was popular, so the idea that you would embed this within communities and members of those communities would serve as advocates and provide that, that signposting. Next slide, please. Um, there was discussion about the, um, I think we're on the wrong slide, aren't we? Is it the next slide? Yeah. I think that's, uh, might even be the next slide. Next slide. No, sorry, the one before. <laughs> okay. Um, there was some discussion about the current community champions model, um, but overall that was seen as a sort of a one-way communication channel. And what leaders were saying is that they wanted a dialogue. They, they didn't want, and there was quite an interesting quote about they didn't want sort of seminars and lectures. They wanted an opportunity to have, you know, that dialogue um, uh, and conversation. Uh, and there were also comments that the current community champions program was a bit hit and miss because, you know, some groups and communities took part um, um, and others um, didn't um, next slide please um, so there was a lot of discussion on how the ambassadors model could work and how it would need to be tailored to the needs of each community um, so for example some community said that their ambassadors would need to speak their community language as not all their members spoke English whereas others said um, women in their community wouldn't feel comfortable if the ambassador was a man so their ambassador would need to be a woman and, and so on um, and unsurprisingly the issue of funding came up um, and there was um, a lot of discussion about models that the council and public health have previously used around sort of mini grants um, and a feeling that while mini grants were great in terms of getting things off the ground um, they were just short term and they weren't sustainable and not all groups found the application process accessible next slide please so in in summary the workshops um, identified with public health the potential to tailor an existing approach the be well hubs which some of you might be familiar with um, that coming out of the workshops it was clear that many of the things that the leaders were asking for were things that actually could be provided within this 
Be Well approach. Uh, and Be Well Hubs is, is, is something being rolled out across South East London by Citizens UK um, and funded by SLAM. Uh, and the idea is that these hubs are based within community organisations and members of those organisations get training to listen to the concerns from their members, provide signposting to services and resources, um, and also report back on what they're hearing. And these BWAR hubs aim to destigmatize mental health and build strong relationships with local health services and other community resources. Um, and also there's a, there's a strong strand of BWAR hubs being able to sort of take action on the barriers and challenges they're hearing from people in their communities. Next slide, please. We've also done quite a lot of work um, with carers over the past year as well. Um, and, and that was in response to a number of, I think, social policy changes and initiatives that, that are, are happening um, on a large scale um, with the sort of home first approach. And absolutely, um, moving care closer to home, allowing people to get the care that they need as appropriate at home rather than having to go to hospital or elsewhere Absolutely a great idea. We'll all vote for that. No one wants to go to hospital, spend time in hospital if they don't have to. However, one of the consequences of that is potentially a heavier burden on carers because, you know, often it's the carers that have to, you know, ring up the social worker to arrange the assessment or organise, you know, the beds, the adjustable bed that has to be delivered. So there's often, you know, a lot more emphasis on um, the support that um, carers and families offer to facilitate that home first approach. So our two projects um, focused on the needs and experiences of carers. The first looked at the experience of carers supporting family members receiving reablement services. Um, and reablement is a type of care provided by a multidisciplinary team um, that essentially helps you to relearn how to do daily activities like cooking meals and, and, and washing. And the approach is to do tasks with a person so they learn to do it themselves and not to do the tasks for them. Um, and it's um, fairly commonly offered as appropriate to those people that need it once they're discharged from hospital uh, and it's available for up to six weeks. The second project, um, again, used participatory methods to work in partnership with black and ethnic minority carers um, to understand um, their support and resource needs. Next slide, please. So what did we hear with regards to um, our work with um, um, carers on reablement? Um, so this is quite interesting because um, uh, carers and people receiving reablement services um, often only heard about the fact that they were going to receive this service um, literally just before they were um, discharged from hospital. Um, and the information they received from the hospital about reablement was, was often pretty brief um, and truncated and didn't really give them enough information to understand what exactly it was, what they should expect, um, what they needed to do. Um, and, and that led to some misunderstanding, confusion and anxiety at, at a time that was already pretty stressful for them. Um, a few days after discharge, um, um, an assessment was delivered um, by reablement staff and that process was, was really positive for many carers because that's when they had the opportunity to ask questions and get a better understanding. Um, although to be fair for some it was still overwhelming because they were still trying to get to grips with the sort of fairly significant life change that had happened to their loved one. Next slide please. Um, so the benefits um, for, for, for carers, um, the, the staff attitudes were fantastic and it created a really open and relaxed atmosphere that carers um, welcomed um, and it gave them a great deal of confidence um, in, the re in the reablement that their loved one was receiving. And that's important because obviously reablement's only there for you know, an hour a day or, or a couple of hours every couple of days. But in between that, it's really down to the carer to motivate and encourage their loved one to continue the exercises or to continue, you know, doing those things to help them relearn um, daily activities. And them having that confidence in reablement staff and the service really motivated carers to, to want to do that. 
It was also quite interesting and unexpected that um, some carers found that they actually got sort of like mini respite when reablement staff were in the house because they felt well they don't have to be sort of watching their loved one for you know every minute um because the reablement staff were going to be there for two hours and then they had two hours to you know walk around the garden or go and buy a newspaper or get a cup of tea or whatever it was um, and they found that really really valuable next slide please um there were challenges, as mentioned. Um, carers did feel unprepared um, at the start, unsure of what to expect. Um, uh, and also, we, we did come across examples of where greater cultural sensitivity would be welcomed. And I think there's a, a quote um, at the bottom there. Um, um, one of the women that we spoke to um, wears a hijab. Um, and normally, she would take the hijab off at home. And she'd ask for female staff and originally female staff were coming in for her, her loved one, but suddenly it changed and male staff were sent in, but there was no discussion. She didn't know this was gonna happen. They were coming in, I think four times a day or something. It was really a lot. So she had to keep her hijab on at home um, for the whole time. And, and she really felt that she, she couldn't relax at home. Um, and uh, so that, that was um, um, an, an issue. Um, there was also confusion about what time staff would, would turn up, um, again, meaning that carers often found it hard to sort of plan or organize um, other parts of their, their lives. Um, and at the end of the reopenment period, um, carers were often unsure about the next steps or what further support um, might be needed um, and what the financial implications might be. Next slide, please. So um, as a result of, of, of our work, um, the Reablement Service has committed to um, improving that information um, exchange and um, working with the hospital, particularly at the point of discharge, um, to make sure that there are more comprehensive conversations that are had with both service users and carers about what this Reablement Service is, what does it mean, how does it work, so everyone's um, hopefully on the same um, page. Um, more check-ins during the Reablement um, period um, as well. Um, and in addition to that, um, as part of a, a wider piece of work that I know is, is, is going on um, within um, Oxleys, um, they're also um, going to be rolling out um, EDI training um, for staff um, and appointing EDI champions um, to hopefully um, improve understanding and better meet um, um, the uh, cultural needs and preferences of service users. Next slide, please. Um, so this is, is just a, a summary of some of the findings um, from this project. Again, this was really interesting because we recruited, trained, um, supported and paid a group of black and ethnic minority um, carers to help us shape and develop this project. Um, and in fact, that approach was so successful, one of those carers is now a member of our board, um, which was great for us. Um, so essentially, carers find their roles unsurprisingly, both rewarding and challenging. And what was interesting is that um, initially carers don't see themselves as carers. They just see it as just normal part of family life. You know, you just help out in these situations. And it's actually only over time with increased responsibility that they begin to realize their role is more than just helping out. And that increased responsibility for some um, can become quite difficult and overwhelming. Next slide, please. So uh, some key challenges include um, access to information about benefits and entitlements um, and support services. Um, and because they find it really hard to sort of find that information and support, they tend to turn to family and friends um, because they can't find the support or they don't believe that the services will meet their needs. Um, and when they do try and access services, sometimes um, the delays that they find in accessing those services or those services delivering the service um, puts even more pressure on them. Next slide, please. Uh, carers again spoke about the importance of services understanding and respecting their cultural background uh, and how this shaped their needs. Um, we also heard testimony from some carers who felt judged by services because of either their ethnicity, their race or, or their language. Next slide please. Um, and again this is a bit of a summary just to, to really share that carers health and well-being are affected across 
all domains really, personal, emotional, social and financial. We heard a lot about loneliness, we heard a lot about isolation, um, and again, the lack of support are common issues. Um, and, and the demands on carers' times, you know, often means they just don't have um, the opportunity for social interactions or to take up paid work. Next slide, please. So as, as part of this, this project, we also spoke to a small number of professional stakeholders. And, and by that, I mean um, the representatives of organizations who provide services or support for carers. Um, and, and that was quite interesting because they suggested that most of the carers using their support services were, were, were white. Um, and they actually weren't getting um, a lot of use of their services um, from black and ethnic minority um, communities um, throughout the borough. Um, now, they did talk about um, work to increase engagement um, and doing more outreach, um, but a lot of that was still um, in the early stages, so we, we don't know how successful that work will be. Um, in addition, all the, all the work they spoke about in terms of trying to engage more within communities was all a bit of I don't know, add-on was the only way I can describe it. Um, it, it. There wasn't any sort of fundamental thinking about how well do these services meet the needs of all of our communities. It was very much an assumption that, oh, people are not using us because they don't know about this, which, which might well be true, but it, there may be other reasons why people are not using those, those um, um, services. Um, next slide, please. Um, and I think that's probably something I've already covered about services um, not meeting their, their cultural uh, needs and, and systemic issues um, complicating their um, access to support. And there are some interesting quotes there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'm not going to read the recommendations. They're, they're, they're in the, 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 the pack. Um, but um, I, I can tell you that we're, we're a little disappointed that we haven't received a response um, from the council um, to our recommendations. Um, as I know that obviously there have been some staff changes in, in, the, in the council, um, but um, we are very keen to work with and support the council um, and hopefully taking forward some of these recommendations. Um, we do know that the council has used some of, some of um, the work from this project in shaping their carer strategy. I think it's 20 four to 27 carer strategy, which is, is heartening, but, but um, we would like the opportunity to work with the council a bit more um, on these recommendations. Next slide, please. Um, many of you here already receive our feedback reports, but I just wanted to touch on them. So our monthly feedback reports are where we sort of capture um, and share um, residents' experiences um, and sometimes what's worked um, and sometimes what hasn't worked so well. Uh, common issues, unsurprisingly, inclu include um, difficulties um, getting um, GP appointments um, and long waits at Queen Elizabeth Hospital. We know that one of the things that, that we, we've heard from um, our system partners is that they find our feedback reports um, useful because it gives them um, sort of up-to-date um, intelligence on the sorts of things that, that people are saying about health and care services. Um, and it's something that, as I say, we produce on a monthly basis. So it, it, it gives very sort of timely um, um, feedback. And we know that commissioners and providers do use our feedback reports um, to support them um, to inform policy and service improvements. Next slide, please. So I, I just want to leave you with, with um, um, a case study. Uh, and again, um, we do tend to include um, case studies in our monthly feedback reports. Um, and I just want to leave this with you because I think this really highlights the impact of what happens when things don't work well. So Vanessa's a carer for her mother, Penny. Earlier in the year, earlier in the year Penny, age 91, fell and broke her hip. Although Penny received good care, her home, re her home re rehabilitation became difficult because of delays and miscommunication. 
After her injury, Penny was in hospital until she was able to return home and begin rehabilitation. Vanessa, who lives in Spain, had to return to England to look after her mum. Mum's always been out. She's had local church group meetings, a social club lunch, and other clubs that she regularly went to. She hasn't been able to do any of that since the fall. She's desperate to get back to it all. As part of Penny's rehabilitation, the physiotherapist placed an order with NRS Healthcare for a shower stall and grab bars for the shower and toilet. These aids would help Penny to have a shower and use the toilet without assistance. When NRS Healthcare delivered the equipment, the order was incomplete and there was no plan to install it. The equipment was too big to store in the bathroom, so Vanessa had to put it in the lounge. Mum already had to move her bed down to the lounge. I had to move furniture around to find a place for the wet room chair. It's awkward. The following week, NRS staff arrived to install grab bars in the shower and toilet, but claimed not to have enough information to complete the work. Vanessa tried to negotiate with them. With them. Uh, I told him that the physio and occupational therapy had already sent the details to NRS. I emphasised that it wasn't difficult to see where they needed to go. NRS staff left without installing the grab bars. Vanessa contacted the physio team who ordered a smaller shower stall. NRS, however, delivered the wrong product. Vanessa contacted NRS again. When I asked where, when the small shower stall was coming, they said there was nothing on order. They made me feel guilty like I was asking them to do me a favour, imposing myself on them. She said, the NRS person, I should try Amazon or Argus or a mobility shop instead of NRS. Mum went six weeks without a shower. Eventually, NRS delivered a small shower stall. No one from NRS showed up to install the toilet and shower grab bars, and Greenwich Council had to step in and do it. It should have been done weeks ago. My mother could not have a shower the whole time, and she had to have strip washes. If Greenwich Council hadn't come to do the bars, I'd still be waiting. So that's just really a real-life example that underscores the Im impact of when services don't work, um, the extra pressure that puts on, on carers um, and service users themselves, um, and the importance of really effective coordination um, between services. Next slide, please. Yep, open for questions or comments. Okay, a few. Thank you very much, Joy. That was really, really interesting. And... Um, so, Councillor Okoreki, did you put your hand up first? I did put my hand up. Um, thank you very much, uh, Joy, for your presentation and the work that um, the work that Health Watch Greenwich is doing uh, in the borough. Because obviously, presentations like this are, are really important because it helps shine a light of how services work. And obviously, every single one of us in this room should be making services better, but also shining a light so that we can make sure services are well joined up to support our residents. Um, just coming on to certain things, so I was really um, interested in the work around Be Well Hubs. Uh, so I would really like to understand some of the importance of the learning from that, uh, especially about and where it was conducted, because uh, I do think there's something to be learned here on, on, on that type of um, uh, initiative. Um, and also on the feedback on, uh, um, on the work of carers, and I think it's really nice to see the insights from that report and, and really important and the narrative around the implications of reablement and sometimes the um, maybe the, 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 the being treated at home and, and being independent the, 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 the pressures that that can have on a, on a carer um, and obviously there seems to be a not real opportunity there to continue to work with our teams with the carer strategy that they have and the action plan to feed into these learned experiences. And I think there's probably cross collaboration. And my ask to um, the chair of the health warm being board and cabinet member uh, is to pick up that um, opportunity to respond back and feedback and align some of the learnings and, and catch on that. Because I'm sure we would ideally want to do that ourselves. Thank you. I'm, I'm just going to take one more, one or two more questions. Uh, Andrew. Thank you, Joy, um, and an incredibly rich learnings from that report all the way through, uh, and a lot of detail. What I'm interested in is how the – you obviously do a lot of help for the people, direct help, and there are some projects as well, like the reablement project that you're doing in collaboration, and the learnings of that have clearly incorporated into the provider's 
services. But in the other ones, how do you get the, those rich learnings into the council or the providers or whatever? What is the mechanism by which those are learned and what's the evidence that we have that those have been listened to uh, and considered? I mean, maybe rejected, but considered uh, so that we, go, that we go forward. Thank you. Do you want to take one more? Or is, are you here? Is that enough? We can um, well, go I, well, I think I think maybe Steve, did you want to talk about the bee well hub? So I don't know if you wanted to. Oh no, okay, all right, fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, all right. Well, you, we'll, we'll just just to start with the um, second question first. So, in terms of the um, mechanism that that we use to. Uh, hopefully ensure that there is um, um, impact and, and some action as a result of what, what service users um, and carers have, have told us. All our work is done in collaboration with whoever's providing that service. So for instance, with reablement, we work very closely um, with the um, reablement team, um, which means that we get senior leadership buy-in from that service right from the beginning. Um, and um, the reablement service were very, very collaborative and very, very supportive um, in terms of, of us carrying out that, that work. Um, so I suppose one of the mechanisms is that right from the beginning we work in partnership. Secondly, we get um, senior leadership um, buy-in. Thirdly, obviously the report is shared, but it's published. It's in the public domain um, as well. But we also have an internal follow-up mechanism. So every sort of quarter we'll go back to either the senior leader or whoever sort of leads the team to, to find out a bit more because what we often find is quite rightly um, that the service is continually developing and they're not necessarily going to come back to us and say, oh, and by the way, and we've now done this, that and the other. So, you know, it's for us to, to try and, and um, go back to them and understand more about um, what, what they're doing. But um, we're very lucky. We have very positive relationships with all our system partners. Uh, and of course, we sit on various sort of boards and committees, but actually it's the personal relationships um, and the trust that we have um, within um, system partners that enables us to work in partnership, um, in collaboration, um, and yeah, that's it. That's that. And just going back to the point about um, um, Bewell, um, Anthony, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the question. <laughs> no, it was just um, the learnings of Bewell um, and where about it took place and where can we find more information of it? Because I, I do think it's really interesting that point about community work and the work we have with our own advice hubs. Um, and it just seems a real opportunity there to do something a bit more greater. Yeah. Um, so Be Well is a program that, um, as I understand it, is, is funded by SLAM. Um, it's been rolled out across um, the whole of, of, of South East London. And essentially, it's a bit of like a community development approach. So they offer... I think it's something like three days training um, to um, community leaders. And the idea is that their places of organization become almost sort of little, little mini centers of places where people can go to find out more about what information is available to support their mental well-being, what resources are available to support mental well-being, what services are there, and how do they, they access them. It's only started to make sort of inroads into, into Greenwich um, now. Now, but I know it's something that, as I say, as part of the work that we did with public health, there's a recognition that actually much of what the Be Well Hubs is offering is actually what communities were asking for. Um, yeah, so, thank you. Just one point, it might be worth for us to um, understand where that is happening in Gridge and get a visit in. Thank you. Uh, I'm Adele, uh, Anne Marie, and then Rachel. Sorry, Mark had a question, didn't he? Sorry. No? Okay. Uh, thank, you so, thank, thank you so much for your report. I think it's uh, great. It touches on a lot of things that you know, we've been saying for a number of years. And it's a shame that a lot of it is still continuing coming forward again in front of the council. And the dis you know, actions are not being delivered. And I think Anne-Marie talked about earlier on the purpose of this board itself. Is there a talking shop or a board that's going to make actions and make sure that some of these stigmas that communities have regarding, you know, the information being passed across to immigration, you know, the stigma around mental health and how some communities don't see it and deny it or it's not accepted within the religion or whatever kind of stuff. And also regarding the ethnicity and stuff like that. So... To me, I think your report is perfect. It touches on a lot of important things, but I'm keen to understand what we are going to do about it because I don't want to be sitting here in months' time coming forward 
and the same report coming forward and we haven't done nothing about it. It's a waste of my time. It's a waste of everybody's time putting the pen to paper to bring this report forward. So I really would want us to have a proper action plan that is deliverable and evidence that we have delivered and, and using community leaders like I said, people go to community leaders for advice and bringing digital inside as well because a lot of digital uh, gap as well but I really want us to be for, uh, forward thinking instead of just being uh, stuck in a room and talking and coming back and talking again because I ain't got time for it. Anne-Marie? Yeah, thank you um, again. Uh, just as a little bit of a background, I did do a small stint well before your time at um, Healthwatch. So, for example, one of the key things about Healthwatch is that they go out, well, they used to in my day, go out into the community to do the work, yeah? So it brings me to the question, I think it's a lot of data in there, and I'm sure there's a lot more than what you've given us, but it does raise um, questions. So, for example, I was sort of curious, specifically with the, um, the shared experiences. Um, you said 3,450 people shared their experiences. I was curious about how many interventions that were, because the number is there, because obviously it wasn't one in, I know you don't work that, it's not one intervention. So it'd be a good idea to say out of, I don't know, 12 interventions, you've got that number or something like that. So that I thought is something to make that the work a bit. And then it also linked in with the, BAME, I hate that word, but um, acronym, but it is what it is. The um, global majority carers. I saw participants up to 21 in the comments, you know, the red bit, but it made me then question, oh, how many were there? So I didn't get a sense of the total, but I noticed you had comment, participant number 21, I think was the highest number that I saw. Uh, regarding the reablement, I was curious to learn the duration because an important point that um, I can um, I fully understand in the community I am a support network I suppose for a neighbor that lives down the road you know you live next door to somebody you see them deteriorate over time so I'm actually a key holder for the family um, because even the carers will lock themselves out I find that be quite amusing <laughs> so, so I'm a key holder and um, when you said that the, um, the reablement team would turn up for two hours, and I, I couldn't, that I couldn't sync with. If they're there for two hours, which is fantastic if they are. I might have to are, ask you to wrap up that question, if you can, just giving you a... Just yeah, we, yeah, yeah if, if they are, how long is... How many two-hour visits are there? Because I've never heard of two-hour visits, but, yeah, thanks. Rachel. Thank you. Um, two points I'd just like some more info on. Um, on the highlights of the year, you said you did uh, visits to 11 learning disability care homes. I think we've all seen or aware of the, was it dispatches in the last few weeks about some of the appalling conditions. So I just want to some assurance that those sort of types of concerns aren't happening within the Greenwich care homes, and that's my things coming out of that. And my second point is with the community safety hat on. Um, obviously, we have a VORG strategy, and part of that is around identifying FGM and domestic abuse. Um, and I want to know particularly, are you confident that our services can identify and support women affected from practicing communities of FGM and domestic abuse? And did you see that when you were looking at the maternity care uh, for migrant women. And just before you come in, Joy, on Adele's point, um, I think that might be one that I can take back and work with Joy and, and others on the board. So just to say that, kind of, I would assure you that we all come back um, on that. Um, but yeah, and then if you could pick up the rest. Um, I think the first thing to say is that, that all the system partners um, that we work with are absolutely committed to providing um, the, the best quality and excellent care um, throughout every service. And, and to be frank, they wouldn't be interested in working in partnership with us and being open and transparent and accountable in their work with us unless that was a, an absolute com commitment. So as Healthwatch Greenwich, you know, I get that um, um, assurance um, that there is that commitment. Um, 
so I think that's that's the, the sort of the, the first thing um, I want to say. Um, just um, moving on to, to your point, um, Rachel, we haven't published, we, I think we published five of the 11 um, visits that we've done to learn disability care homes. Uh, and I can tell you from what we've seen so far, they're fantastic. Um, one of the things that we are going to do is a bit of a reflection um, comparing the sorts of issues and themes and, if I'm honest, how great our learning disability care homes are compared with some of our not so great maybe elderly care homes and, and why is it that actually maybe all the elderly care homes can't be as good as um, what we've seen. Um,